Hi, um, hello everyone. Welcome to the FAIR Virtual Film Festival. Um, it's day three of the film festival and today we have Desh Amila and Kurt Jaimongol. I just learned how to pronounce his name. With us today, um, they are director and producer of the film Better Left Unsaid. Um, hopefully you guys have actually watched the film. If not, the short summary is that um, it's actually a documentary that offers a very uh, nuanced take on political extremism. And that's something that, you know, I think is everyone can see all over the world, no matter where you are, that it's it's pretty uh, political extremism is, is very current topic. Um, and, and, you know, Better Left Unsaid is a film that kind of examines it. It features some of the most uh, well-known thinkers of our time. Um, you know, it features Steven Pinker, Coleman Hughes, Noam Chomsky. Um, and I, I think it's a very important um, film in terms of dissecting where we are in this political moment. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to talk to Desh and Kurt about it. Um, Desh, I've actually worked with previously. Um, he actually produced, a, his last film was Islam and the Future of Tolerance. That was um, kind of based on the same, uh, the book by the same uh, topic, the same name. Uh, featuring Sam Harris and and Majid Nawaz, so so Desh is really kind of no stranger to controversy, and um, you know this is just another area that I think you know he's waded into, which I think is also very relevant for you know the kind of um, the kind of activism that Fair is very involved in. Um, these are all very difficult topics. Desh, you seem like an intellectual. It, it seems like you're plagued by this intellectual BDSM almost, like you like the difficultness of things is something that particularly draws you in. Um, if I'm not wrong, that's just what it seems like. Um, so I'm really, really excited to talk to you about this. So for everyone participating today, um, if you go to the, the chat box, you'll be able to type in your questions. If you have any questions for both Desh and, and Kurt about anything relating to the film, relating to you know the larger discourse um, at large, Anything that you want to ask, just kind of put it in the chat box, and um, you know we'll be able to to talk about it. So let's let's get into it, Kurt and Desh. Um, so tell me a bit about you know why did you guys want to do this film in the first place? Let's let's just even start there. Well, we have two very different reasons um, to make you know, why we made the film, uh, and I want to. Uh, Kurt should explain his version because he actually got this whole project started and then only uh, yeah, I joined. I was lucky enough to join. Okay, so there's the extreme left, there's the extreme right, and the extreme right is characterized by racism and blatant racism. But then the extreme left seems to be motivated by at least what they say is compassionate care for the underprivileged and so on. And uh, but then I'm wondering, well, why is it that they there's obviously some claims that seem nonsensical to people who consider themselves to be center, center right, center left, and obviously to the extreme right as well, but they dislike anything to the left of them. And as I analyze it, the more I realize that it's extremely nuanced, it becomes even philosophical, and I'm someone who likes to play with ideas. So I thought, well, why don't I investigate this and lay out my thought process or my research results in documentary form? I'm a filmmaker, so why not do that? Okay, that's 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 a good um, positioning. So how it uh, came towards me was Kurt seen my first film, Islam and the Future of Tolerance, and he was in the early stages of figuring out how does one independently get a documentary out? So he uh, called, emailed me saying, hey, I have a film, uh, can you help? And you know, I'm a big fan of just you know, talking to filmmakers and people who are trying to do something that's a bit different. So I gave him a few advice and then eventually he sent me a rough cut of the film. Uh, to be 100% honest, initially, I didn't think too much of those conversations, I didn't think there's going to be anything meaningful. But when I saw the rough cut, I, I realized, oh, wow, there's, you know, this captured a lot of thoughts that were going through my head. Um, you know, everyone around me uh, throwing words around like, you know, civil war or, um, you know, um, uh, our freedoms have been curtailed or so really serious words. Um, 
and most of these people were living in their you know safe neighborhood, neighborhoods in New York or LA or in Sydney talking about these you know extreme events that may be happening unless they take action and i come from sri lanka a country that had a civil war for 28 years uh, you know anyone who's lived through uh, some form of real oppression and 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 a war will tell you those words have a literal meaning and they trigger a different set of uh, you know images and visions so when people are loosely throwing these words around I, I, I was wondering like what is going on like this is this is not really real and then I started seeing the you know all the things that were happening in college campuses uh, and some of that being exported to countries like Australia and you know UK and Canada and I, I've been wanting to talk about this, and as you eloquently put it, Melissa, you know, it's intellectual BDSM. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I do have an interest into uh, uh, delving into topics that people seem to be quite scared to talk about. So when Kurt sent me that rough cut, I realized this is the conversation we need to be having. So that's that. That was that, those were my reasons to start working on the project. Because it's it's really interesting. Because Dash, you're you're Australia based, and Kurt, you're in Canada. If I'm, if, am I not wrong? Toronto, yeah. Yes, and this film is very largely. I I, I feel like it, it does focus on the American context of political extremism. You have these cuts, right, in the beginning of the film that that kind of shows extremism on both sides. But later on, you know, as, as the film progresses, you kind of break down certain concepts. I do like that. This film is actually very educational. You break, you, you kind of like go into certain concepts that almost like underlie some of this extremism that you see going on. So it's in a way, it's not just like a, a, a regular documentary. It, it has an educational component to this. Um, and I just find it interesting that two people in, um, you know, kind of like different parts of the world have seen this, what's going on in America, Explored it almost, and and it you know feels so strongly about the need to kind of you know make a film countering it, or, or even just like talking about this because I think that's that's really something that the film goes goes into and and to feature people you know the the intellectuals like um, like Steven Pinker and Noam who are really on both sides of their of the political spectrum. But, but on the other hand, also have some sort of uh, commonality in terms of the, the values that, that, that they embrace. So I, I find that very powerful. Um, so it, it's interesting, like, so, you know, why hell focus on something that's happening in America? Did you say why well, focus on um, what's going on in America? Yeah, yeah because <laughs> you're Canadian and, you know, Dash is Australia based. Okay, there's a couple of reasons. So one is that me, most of the footage that exists is just is American. So when we're cutting to footage, B-roll, as they call it, it's going to be American, at least 70% of it, because 70% of the footage automatically is from just to, uh, just the selection pool. And as for, and then there's also second, the appeal to Americans. There's also the fact, there's also that, I didn't, I didn't even make that connection, Melissa, because to me, I see what's going on in America as, and we did have Bruce Party, and which was a Jordan Peterson event. We had quite a few Canadian examples. The reason why Desh is involved from the Australian perspective is that he sees it happening there as well. In fact, my editor is Turkish, and he said, "Kurt, can I trans? I'll translate this movie for free for you because what's happening? This is exactly what's happening in Turkey. There's some. It's analogous. It's not exactly, but." It's happening in many parts of the world. So when you say this, what you're what you're saying is is like a political extremism, some sort of orthodoxy that is happening in America that that seems to have American roots, but is almost being exported or mapped instantly into other cultures globally. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say it has American roots because if if those of you who watch the film, you'd see that some of the roots are social constructionism and then Marxism, and those are European. At least there's the Frankfurt School, which is European for sure. So yeah. I wouldn't say it's entirely American. In fact, it was exported and then the roots of it stayed in Europe and, and festered. Right. No, no, there's I, also, I'm, Melissa, there's also an argument to be made um, where when you're 
a little bit removed and from a situation where you're looking at the situation, you see a little bit more than if you're in the situation. For example, uh, when I lived in Sri Lanka, literally when suicide bombs were going uh, on uh, around the corner, I wholeheartedly believed Sri Lanka was the best place to live and it was the best country in the world. Anything else, BBC or anybody else reported, were just lies that the foreigners spread about this beautiful country and this you know, amazing place. It was only when I left Sri Lanka and looking back at the civil war, just looking at, you know, horrified to seeing, oh, this is not normal, this is not okay. And I do feel like, uh, you know, within the siloed voices, in uh, in politics in America, people tend to be talking just to their audience. And you know, this is not to say that you know we we have a, a, a special lens here, but for us, we could see it. And then for Kurt's point, to Kurt's point, this is happening. And America has the largest microphone. Uh, where whatever happens in America, it is eventually going to go to the rest of the world anyway, and it's already happening. You know, I can give a you know bunch of anecdotal evidence. Uh, you know, which uh, not so long ago, the national broadcaster in Australia published this um, a documentary um, uh, about racism at the uh, Sydney Opera House, which is one of the most diverse places that I know of this country, and their examples were just extraordinarily bad like they weren't examples of racism uh, you know their the prime example was somebody uh, wearing blackface now that is objectively wrong but here's the catch this person had nothing to do with this uh, space or he didn't work there he came there for a party and with under five minutes he was asked to leave by the staff of the venue, um, which is actually for me showcasing that they do take these things. Real. It's the opposite of them being racist. So that was the leading reason as showing that this Institute of Australia is somehow systemically racist. You know, so this, if we don't talk about this, this, this is going to be somehow normalized and we are going to pick uh, our, uh, you know, uh, grievances when there are no grievance to be picked. So in other words, you, you think there is some moral panic going on? Absolutely. I know uh, Sam Harris keep harping on about it, but I, I, I that's the word I would use. Yes, there is definitely a moral panic going on. And and how do you think that moral panic or, or if you accept the moral panic as it is being inflamed or being accepted or, or paraded in the, in the press as a fact, how do you think that affects, you know, like the real world? Do you think it affects policy? Do you think it affects, you know, like actual substantive realities that we have to deal with? Um, I do think so, because um, when we have a natural tendency to fight against evil, right? Um, and we have, you know, when we see something uh, especially, so I'm, I, I'm on the political left, the center left. I, it's generally progressives have this, uh, you know, view of the world where uh, oppressed and minorities need to be protected. Uh, so when you hear more and more, your country, your systems, your policies are racist or just systemically doing damage to a certain group of people, you're going to go with all your might. And try to fight against that. And then the policies a country will then enact will reflect that. And there, that's just a recipe for disaster. Kurt, what do you think? How have you seen that this moral panic, do you, do you see that it has affected anything in the real world that you feel compelled about addressing? I don't have much to add to what Desh said. He said it wonderfully. I I don't have much to add to that. Okay. Thank you, Dash. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to the guests that you you know you feature very prominently. You have Steven Pinker, Coleman. What what drew you to these um, these public intellectuals about their message? Well, for one, like you mentioned, Noam and Pinker are on the opposite sides, but yet they agree about free speech, and uh, well, they disagree about ninety nine percent of other issues. That's not true. Ninety percent of sixty percent of other issues. They agree that free speech matters and, and 
But that's something, so free speech in the Canadian context and the Australian context is very different um, than the American context. It feels like America has a First Amendment, which is very unique among all nations on earth. Um, and, you know, it's, that is something that is vigorously contested now in universities. You do see, you know, some polling that shows that the next generation is very skeptical about, about the need to protect free speech. In fact, in, in, in many instances in schools, you know, you have students, especially at the higher education level, challenging that. Now, you know, the, the, the reason that FAIR was very interested in your film is because um, it, it showcases this phenomenon, this like slow erosion of the, 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 the possibility of entertaining, you know, different ideas or accepting it. Um, and, and our concern is actually that, you know, we start seeing that um, happening at the K to 12 level. So now they're bringing these ideas that were once obscure ideas in sort of the ivory tower and they're, they're now being repurposed and applied in K to 12. Um, and, and so the urgency of this, of, the, of debating this is, has really, be, you know, is on the forefront of the American consciousness. And so many stories have bubbled up. You're starting to see um, parents organizing, getting together. Um, what are your thoughts about, about, you know, what happens when this kind of intolerance, which is really what your film is about, like extremism at the end of the day, seems like, you know, about doubling down on tribes and inability to discuss different ideas and intolerance, a fundamental intolerance of the other, um, you know, being manifested as, as, you know, doctrine or as part of the curriculum, like what do you see as the dangers to something like that? Well, there's arrogance for one, because they think that they already have some answer that they don't need to hear the other side. For example, the IQ debate, forget about race, just talking about IQ in general, it's, it's you're accused of of being a phrenologist, essentially. Of, right, there's, from the, there are so many domains, right? So there's there are things like um, IQ, there's things like race in America, there's things like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the gender issue, you know, where you are in gender ideology. So, I, you know, I think like identifying these taboos in society, and I think the, the real world applications of something like that, where, where speech gets labeled as taboo and, you know, like you got a left unsaid, like you said, um, in the title of your film, you start to see where like discourse uh, starts to have a boundary where we can talk about it. Um, good example of something like that happening right now is, is something like the lab leak hypothesis, right? Like where we're exactly. like, right. discover, yeah, the origins of this. Or even um, vaccines the safety, the efficacy, well, the efficacy seems clear, but the safety of them or the risks right. that come along with, it. man, I, I wanted to discuss this on, I have a podcast. I want to discuss it on my podcast and I'm worried that I would get demonetized from YouTube or censored in some way. And that's where I make my living. And the fact that I think that for something that's such an important issue that I, I wonder, can I even discuss this without losing my, my main income? So he, this is the thing, right? You know, uh, Again, my example of coming from Sri Lanka, people don't realize this uniqueness of your ability to say whatever you want. You know, when uh, the far left was completely losing its mind, calling uh, Donald Trump um, Hitler, um, what they you know failed to see, fuck Trump was number one on iTunes. You know, in a in a country, you know, I can name so many countries that would never happen. You know, the, you know, this this ability to have these open conversations about uh, anything that's a unique thing, and it is a precious thing. And you're absolutely right. So many people I know, you know, it's so funny. In Australia, I've had I, I started posting this on my social media where I would quote people who have explicitly told me things that, that they absolutely love the movie, but they're like, "Don't tell anyone I said this." You know, comedians, uh, you know, famous journalists, authors, uh, scientists who would agree with you know, all these things, but they would never say that these things in public. It's already happening, and that's a terrible place to be in. And uh, you know, um, I I am not a free speech absolutist. I'm still trying to understand the whole process, but I would definitely 
don't want to live in a world where I can't say what I want to say. You know, part of it is my ignorance. I'm just trying to understand. I'm just a curious mind, right? I, I'm not an academic. I haven't studied the thing. So the problem is, though, um, these things don't get taken away from you overnight. You know, uh, what's happening in places like, you know, Hong Kong is a very different story to what's happening in America. Like, Hong Kong is a nightmare scenario. Myanmar, nightmare scenario. Those things literally did happen, uh, you know, quite overnight. I mean, Hong Kong is another story. Hong Kong was slowly eroded away. But anyway, what's happening in America and the West is it's almost behind the scenes. You know, you don't really realize. And a really valid point you made, uh, Melissa, about the next generation and how they're thinking, you know, by the in next 10 years, if there aren't enough of uh, us and voices like us really harping on about this, I think it'll, it's gonna, by the time you realize it's happened, it's gonna be a little too late. And Melissa, yeah. speaking, sorry. Go on, Kurt. Speaking on this, this reluctance to speak up, like you mentioned, we mentioned that there are people who, fame, journalists and comedians and so on who like the film but won't come forward and say that they do. Even I, when I was making the movie, Melissa, I thought, should I just do this anonymous narrated and not even put my name on it? Because I don't know, how is that going to affect my future? And then I thought, well, that's bravery, man. That's that's courage to do that, that sarcastically. And so that's why I put my face on it. Part. I, I think there's also an element of sort of like a fighting identity politics, uh, you know, in, in a way that to get the message across to the people who actually really need to hear this, you might have to play their game. And the fact that both of you kind of up the trend, like you're not, you know, just both of you are, you know, according to the less rubric, people of color, you kind of have, you know, some sway in the hierarchy that intersectionality has built up. Right. And so I think it's a bit shocking to, to see that because, and, and it might jolt people who might otherwise have been very closed to the idea because, you know, if you think about it, like many of the, Steven Pinker, for example, in your film, he's been talking about these ideas for a long time, but largely because Steven is white himself or is view as, viewed as white because he's actually really, he's also Jewish um, and Canadian. Um, but someone like him gets unfairly dismissed because he's just another white guy talking about these issues. But now you have two brown guys, people of color talking about these issues, you know, with, with connections to lands with, with where real oppression kind of really goes on with the government and, and stamping down dissent. There is a bit of a moral authority with, with your film, especially, I like the cutaways that, you know, that has you, Kurt, kind of explaining these concepts, because I think it's actually very powerful. These concepts actually are very esoteric, and, and they've been popular in the academy for a long time, but they're really only reaching mainstream now. So in that sense, I, you know, that's kind of why the film is powerful, because it explains a lot of these very far-fetched kind of academic ideas in, a, in an accessible way, juxtaposing them with scenes that, that you kind of cut away to that are happening right now. So they're contemporary and, and very current. Well, firstly, I'm a heterosexual cis male, so then they can dismiss me because of that. Or, and then That's I've got to right, and then just by the, <clears throat> the fact that I'm espousing what goes against the extreme left, then I'm the supporter of white supremacy, either directly or indirectly. Thus, I'm white supremacist adjacent. So they're ad, ad hominem attacks, but they're yeah, yeah. But, so but the, also, the the title of the film, I, I think, is very powerful and and alludes to that that idea because. I think we all see the, the the evilness, the obvious evilness of right wing ideology when when it goes very far. Um, the 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 open racism is very obvious to all of us. But when when there's left wing extremism, it seems like at least in the United States, I don't know if it's true, you know, outside of the United States, but that kind of extremism almost gets a, a lot more institutional support, and you can almost very openly, um, so, you know, stake your claim and, and support left-wing extremism without the same level of opprobrium as right-wing extremism is is how do you guys feel about about that is that something that you know you agree with 
Um, yeah, um, it, uh, it's only uh, reading and listening to people like Coleman Hughes um, and Pinkers. I started seeing that because um, you know, uh, I have one up. I can one up Kurt because I'm an immigrant. Um, so I have again in well, the intersectional. But I'm hand off well. There's, long there's a difference, right? You're a second generation immigrant. Like, yes, second. levels, mate. No, I, I came here on I was my born own. In <laughs> Oh, I yeah. want to right. Hey, man, I have more oppression. Uh, <laughs> the Olympics, okay, anyway, the goal the, goes to Dash. The, 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 the point is, though, um, you know, there were certain things I honestly believe uh, as uh, to be factual. Um, and it's only when you sort of take away what people are saying in uh, openly, whether it is the national broadcaster, whether it is, uh, you know, um, uh, policymakers, uh, activists, people who hang around with, or artists. I mean, artists are an extraordinary breed. You know, when I see multi-millionaires spousing, you know, Marxist-inspired quotes, it's just extraordinary to watch it. Not understand. I, I think, no, I think most of them are absolutely sincere. Um, there's a parallel here um, to Islam and the Future of Tolerance, where, again, you know, Majid Nawaz coined the term regressive left. Um, uh, progressives who genuinely wanted to help a minority uh, it would not talk about some genuine issues that needed to be explored. And that's why I made that movie, uh, just talk about Islam in the modern world, you know, where does it fit in? And, you know, understanding those various layers. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but reality is um, you know, this uh, not left, and, and all credit to Kurt here, has, Kurt really explained this in the, in the documentary. Left has a philosophy and it has academia behind it. So it uses words eloquently to present an argument that is quite persuasive, and majority people believe it. Um, you know, I, I, I for the longest time this this is a revelation that happened a few weeks ago, um, and I don't know how many people in Australia will watch this. Uh, if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but in Australia, the widely held belief is indigenous deaths in police custody is an enormous issue. And I believed it up until about you know a couple of weeks ago, and you know, something uh, Coleman Hughes said prompted me to actually look at the data. When I looked at the data, I was just genuinely surprised at how wrong I was, you know. It's, it, it, so, uh, but because it's normalized and presented in whether it's documentary from songs, uh, you know, film, you, know, you you think that's the norm, right? That, that's what that's how things are. And, and actually, that's something that Noam Chomsky, you know, who, who was in your film, who, who wrote about manufactured consent, um, has talked about before. Like he's been, you know, that that's been something that he, he has um, emphasized for a long time, how the media kind of manufactures narratives and narratives become reality. Reality, reality becomes, you know, policy prescriptions. And that's something that we see, you know, this argument about critical race theory. America is it fundamentally racist or not fundamentally racist ultimately comes down to these smaller narratives on which that narrative is built. And so if the smaller narratives that people believe, whether or not, you know, I think you, you I don't know if everybody saw this, but there was a, a very famous uh, study, I think it was done by the, the Skeptical Research Institute or something that asked different people, uh, people of different political persuasions, what their impression of how many Black men unarmed are killed every year by police and based on your pol uh, on your political affiliation um, you could see how wrong how off some people were so if you were very progressive you know you were saying that more than a thousand men black unarmed men were killed every year by police the real number is actually around 18 um, but but based on your on your politics, you were that much of a standard deviation wrong from the actual answer, and and that that is very worrying because then you're going to derive conclusions about America and and going to have other political opinions kind of resting on these you know sort of smaller policy kind of uh, actual numbers um, kind of narratives. Um, but anyway, I I want to go into because 
people are starting to ask really interesting questions um, in the chat box. I want to I want to make sure that everybody's uh, questions to the director and producer and get answered. So um, let's get into it. Um, the first question is at the end of the film, you laid out a few points that need um, that you say, like, we need a shared myth for America. How do you see that being executed and how can it be taught? Can we have that shared narrative actually taught in schools? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a reason the documentary ended on a question is because I, I don't know. I think that that's something we need to think about because it's not like when you hear, and also I wouldn't say America needs a shared narrative. I would say that the world also needs a shared, shared narrative. Otherwise we'll have conflict unless you want conflict. Yeah. So then, so what do we do? Do we just get people to go to church? Is it, is it the traditional narratives? It doesn't seem like that's persuasive at, at all for the modern person. So it's not, it's not clear. The best I can come up with is for each individual person to not lie in their individual life. And then it's like, well, what the heck does lying have to do with it? Well, it, there's a director's cut where I explain a bit more about lying and its connection to the corruption of the world to be Petersonian. So I would say, don't lie. And so that's very Sam Harris too. I think he wrote a whole book on that. Yeah, right, right, right. And I don't know, I don't know his reasons if they're not theological. I, I, I want to re, I want to reread that. I read that like you should read live five years ago. <laughs> his book. Right. <laughs> yeah, I did, like, but a, quite a long time ago. Okay, so don't lie, and then also to be loving, to constantly, constantly be loving. Think, is my, is this act loving? Am I doing this out of hate? Am I doing this out of spite or, or malice or because I'm, I'm callous. So it's, a, it's a, don't lie or, or in other words, tell the truth and, but telling the truth dif is difficult. So don't lie and love in your own individual life. Do that at each instant as much as you can. And then that will spread outward. That's a, the best that I can come up with. Dash, what do you think? Is there a shared myth for America or the world to counter this? So before I answer that, I want to just add one uh, point. Um, this film, I agree about 90% um, some 80 to 90 percent. When Kurt and I, we disagreed on many things and I still wanted this film out. Um, and that's why there's a director's cut where Kurt has everything he wanted to say. Um, this idea of us needing a myth, I think, not I think, this is where we differ. I'm not sure we do need a myth. Um, you know, I, I don't think um, a solution for uh, bad ideas is a myth rather better ideas. I'm more on the Sam Harris camp uh, for this. Um, I do agree with uh, some of the solutions that uh, Kurt is talking about here, where, which is you know, loving uh, kindness and also not lying. I, I, I agree with, with, with those premises, but m I think more of a robust approach for, um, I mean, that's a very individual thing. Um, how does that translate into policy and governance, etc.? cetera? Um, sure, one can have an argument, this will seep in, but I think right now where things are, it, it needs to be a little bit more um, direct. And I think uh, more of a science and reason-based approach to decision-making uh, is with the understanding of the human condition, um, because we are not all stats and numbers, you know, that there is a human at the end of every number uh, is, is a solution. But again, you know, we didn't want to make a movie that says, hey, here's what you got to do. And then everything out of that is going to be all good. We don't really know. Um, you know, we can uh, speculate, um, but we want to more showcase the problem and have some basic ideas of what may, what might work. But it is really, if you don't know the information, you can't act on it, right? So we've had so many people uh, telling us, I had no idea that happened in that country, or I had no idea that this experiment was run this many times. So that's what we wanted to highlight. And also break down where does this, this thinking come from? You know, and then right. you can have better conversations about it. I feel like this is the kind of film that should be shown in, in schools, uh, just to expose oh, kids. Thank you, Melissa. 
yeah no, I, I feel really strongly about it's like every high school should see this i'm like yeah man yeah just to discuss like you know what like one of the first concepts you discussed was like social constructionism like you know it's it's being shoved down their throats, but but not in the same way, and and they're not having honest conversations about it. So, uh, you know, I, I think Fair's position is we shouldn't be banning any point of view. That is not something you know. Like if you stand for liberal values, you you should be able to to say like you know what I want these ideas challenged, and I think I think that's what this film really does. And so if we can get that in schools, which is something that I think we can work together on. Um, you know, like having this film as part of a repertoire of, of part of a, a curriculum. Um, so actually related to that, somebody does has asked, knowing what you know, would you send your child to college in America now? He says that he has a, or she, I have an incoming senior in high school and I'm very concerned, knowing what you know now. Ooh, this is an interesting question. Um, I will answer this to my best ability. So, um, when was it? Two months ago, uh, my eight-year-old came home. Uh, she won she's been given a task to give a speech about racism. And she said, I said, Oh, that's that's a very serious subject. How, how are you gonna talk about it? Remember, this is in Sydney, Australia. And she said, Well, here, you know, our teacher said, talk about it like this and this, and uh, we should talk about uh, George Floyd. And I I I I was just completely taken back. How does an eight-year-old know about George Floyd, in Australia know about George Floyd and how is the connection to racism made? And you know, just hearing that, we, we had a long conversation and she understood that it's not that black and white. Um, she gave a speech differently, uh, but the person who won it actually had this, that reference, uh, that, that contest, um, direct reference to racism, what happened to George Floyd? So with that knowledge, I am personally uh, a little worried. I think, but at the same token, I also understand the value of having an education, uh, a higher education. So it is a conundrum. It is a conundrum. Um, I, I think it needs to be, uh, we still live in a society that once you go to that elite club, you have that special tag next to your name that then opens certain doors. You know, that's that's a fact we of society. But how do we change that? That's a much larger, you know, movement based project um, until what I what I do believe that we can do with the help of people like fair and, and countless other people who are fighting the good fight is we continue to fight. But I don't think that should uh, uh, prompt us to take our kids away from having that higher education. We can do a lot to make sure those institutes uh, are held accountable. And we have a movement to counter this. I think that's, uh, that's my approach anyway. So, you know, we have another question from a pu current public school teacher. Um, he or she writes, I am surrounded in my personal and professional life by those completely indoctrinated by the cult of wokeness. I would never work in my field again if I came out as dubious of the philosophy, which to me seems very intolerant. Staying silent has been my default so far, but I believe this lacks integrity and is toxic to my inner life. How do I interface with friends and colleagues in the way that doesn't completely sacrifice my integrity, but also isn't threatening to their fundamentalist worldview. This is very complex. And I feel like it's creating a lot of trauma in people. How, what, how do you guys respond to something like that? I, uh, but it's, it's easy for please. us. It's easy for us, Melissa, me, you, Dash, to say, hey, man, just stand up. Stand up to them and say what you truly believe and, and destroy your family for the next two years as you, look, as you search for another full-time job. It's easy for us to say that. And then some people say you need FU money. But then there's also, to get back mythologically, there's also the story of Jesus, which Jesus didn't have FU money. In fact, he died for what he was saying. It's the ultimate sacrifice. Hmm. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I think, Dash, you and I kind of like came into this world almost like, like before it, we were kind of in the atheist, critical thinking, skeptic kind of orbit. And in a way, many of us already paid their, that price. Like when you meet somebody who 
you know, grew up in a very conservative religious environment and they say, no, I want no part of it. You lose everything. You lose your, your, your social standing. You lose your maybe sometimes your family. So you pay a very big social or personal price to leaving as this person writes, this public school teacher writes, the cult. He calls it the cult of wokeness. So in a way, when we faced up to this ideology of critical race theory and anti-racism, this is just, if you recognize this religion, just another thing to walk away from. And all right, if I'm going to lose my friends, I already lost you know, people before. So this is nothing. But I'm very sympathetic uh, to, to people who, who don't want to do that. Like, it is awful to navigate life, you know, without, without these attachments that, I mean, the, this is family, you know, and it may be more, maybe colleagues. You want your kids to have the best opportunities in life, as you described earlier. Um, you don't want to deprive them of this. And in a way, like, the only way to, to be a part of it is to, is to still play the game. But then how do you resolve this? Because it sounds like, you know, the person who asks this question is having real issues trying to maintain integrity um, and, and pretend that they believe in something they don't believe in. Yeah, I'd say you don't play the game. I'd say so that's where there's so many people. I think Ben Shapiro said that you play the game until you get enough money or until you can until you gain enough status that you can say no or stand up. But I say you stand up now. I'd say you never you never you never sacrifice your 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 soul in a sense okay i mean so look let, let, let me try to let me try to you know just just add a, add, add a little uh, melissa you you are absolutely on the money about uh, us being ostracized quite early because i was in in that community as well um so for us it's an easier decision to make and kurt um you know at the beginning of this call, we were talking about how you are currently having to think three times before having the conversation about vaccination on your YouTube channel because you might get a strike and you might use your livelihood. Right? It's easier, you know, when you have the FU money, when you have create structures that you are uncancelable, uh, and some of us have worked for over a decade to get to that point um, and to, to make these calls. But I do think, you know, if your livelihood is tied to um, like a school teacher, it's not that simple. I would say, uh, you know, there are different, I mean, to use, a, to use an anal war analogy, there are different ways to fight a war. You know, you can go all on the offensive or you can play the role um, within the, the system work with the, you know within the enemy's territories and trying to understand you know what's happening there and then you know i would say if you are unable to do it i don't think you know jeopardizing your income and your family and your close systems is conducive for, to your ability to uh, uh, continue uh, you know doing what you need to do i would say if you could support movements, whether it's fair, whether it's, I mean, it's very self-serving, but our film to amplify these voices and figure out ways to, so those communities get access to this information that sits outside their bubble. I don't know how to uh, exactly do it. There is no science to it. That, you know, when you normalize dissent the way we are doing right now, that will eventually seep through. Uh, case in point is the global rise in uh, atheism. You know, it's a project that started in, you know, 80s and 90s, and it really got galvanized in the early 2000s. Now it's the norm, right? It, it was a long battle and not everyone came out saying we are atheist, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people had to do a lot of things still within the system to slowly change it. So I don't know if, if, if uh, I, would, I would say just speak out right now and, and jeopardize your livelihood and your families and whatnot. I think there is still an argument to have, you know, have conversations and you know, film like this and Islam and the Future of Tolerance provides you the tools to have that conversation. So you can, uh, you know, you're not coming across as you don't know what you are talking about. You, you know, one last thing here, you know, whenever back in the day, I used to have uh, conversations and arguments and debates with religious people, they're genuinely surprised how much I know about the Bible. 
you know, it, it, uh, generally atheists who engage in these conversations tend to know a lot more about the religion than an average person. You know, so I, I would say that's a way to go. We have a question from Masha, who I know, she's Canadian. Hi, Masha. Um, and her question is, you know, the film touched very movingly and effectively upon, you know, why have we learned about the, the World War II, the Holocaust in school, yet nothing of other equally terrible and horrific examples of mass killings. Um, I think very good examples of that, you know, that, that aren't really taught in school are, you know, the, the legacies of Mao or Stalin. Um, do you have any ideas of how to try and fit all of this cruelty and at least basic reasons behind it um, into the current curriculum in your respective countries of residence? And actually, why isn't it taught? Like, why do you think in Canada or in Australia, even in the United States, that these, these have kind of taken a backseat? And, you know, you think that teaching that will improve the situation that we have I think, right now? I think they're not taught because, like you mentioned, the dominant narrative, let's say, is the is that of the extreme left and not even extreme left, but close to the extreme left. And if you see what happened historically, actually, Melissa, you're asking me, how did this documentary start? It initially started with me posting on Reddit asking, is there a documentary that covers the covers what happened in communism? That's not propagandistic from the US or or from China or wherever. And then someone said, no, nothing modern. And I was searching and searching. Then I thought, huh, I wonder, people keep saying like, Everyone in the IDW keeps saying, there's some connection between Marxism and what's going on now. Is there? I don't know. Let me study it. Let me research it. And then I'll make a documentary and go through my thought process. And it's interesting. There's philosophy and so on, blah, 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 blah. I think that if people or if teachers or if students knew what happened in Marxism, I mean, under the banner of Marxism and under the banner of we're doing this for the poor and we're doing this because we, we care and we're, and so on and so on. I'm sure you've heard this many times. I think if people knew, they would see the connection between what they're being told. This I don't I don't like to disparage, so I don't know other words like woke. But I don't want to use those words, but you I know. understand what I mean. The 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 narrative that there's oppression based on sexuality, race, and and gender. Let's say that 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 would have its roots there, and that may lead to something nefarious. So I think that that's why it's not taught. Dash, I, I don't know if you've noticed this in your work previously with the, the you know, the Islam, the work of, uh, that you had done with Sam and, and Majid. Um, you're starting to see pushback by many sort of mainstream Democrats, either in media or um, at, the, at the level of government, like a, the AOCs of the world. They're starting to say, well, show me where this is real critical race theory. You know, it's not really being taught. What you think is critical race theory is not what's in school. And there's a, a very strange parallel that I've kind of noticed. I don't know if you have about uh, the same kind of a uh, rhetorical kind of, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a tactic, it's a rhetorical tactic uh, that, that has a debate every single time there's a terrorist attack or something like that, an Islamist terrorist attack. We have this debate about what is true Islam and what is not true Islam um, in a way that uh, very easily lends itself to accusations of Islamophobia. And, and the one of the major criticisms right now that you see Joy Reid, for example, in MSNBC is, show me where this is critical race theory. Like, this is anyone criticizing this right now. This is not real critis, critical race theory. And I'm reminded of all conversations about every time there's an Islamist attack, this is not true. You know, we're, we're like debating tenets and trying to find the line between theory and practice. Is that something that you see also? I see that, uh, you know, that making that movie really opened my eyes uh, into that parallel. I see that all the time. Lisa, you're absolutely right on that one. It's just, it is an interesting argument. It is a, you know, it, 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 it really plays into uh, the, the rule book of uh, how to have a good debate, right? It's not really intellectually honest. Um, you know, we had what for almost 20 years whether any of the uh, you know jihadist terrorist attack had anything to do with islam or not it was bonkers to watch uh, because of course it did you can't say it had nothing to do with uh, you know what's happening same thing it is repeating now 
you know, with, with, with CRT. Um, uh, so earlier you asked the question, why is this not taught? I honestly, uh, when I went to school in Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka is a socialist republic of Sri Lanka. So, you know, the people in power did not see that whatever happened in, in those socialist countries was somehow uh, important to be uh, passed on to the masses. Uh, so I didn't learn about that stuff. Um, and there is a interesting point Steven Pinker makes in the movie that what percentage of uh, professors and teachers are on what side of the political aisle and disproportionately a large percentage of is on the left. And if they haven't heard about these stories in the first place because of you know, how they read this information in the first place, they're never going to pass that on and they're not gonna actively go out and get that information. Um, so I think that's why um, with regards to rights atrocities, um, you know, the collective West have done an incredible job of preserving what has happened because we never want that to happen. And you know, and and the, some of the people who it happened to, and the different generations of them are living with us. So it was an it's an easier thing to be remembered year in year, in, year out. But you know, the West didn't have a collective effort to. Uh, do anything with regards to what happened in the, 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 the socialist countries. So, you know, it isn't sort of connected in a way that it can it can be taught year in, year out. But that definitely needs to change because it should be taught. And when you hear those stories, um, I hear from socialists over and over again. I've heard this from Noam Chomsky himself, who, who says, you know, when whenever a socialist country gets into trouble, it's just that's that was never real socialism anyway. So. Wow, so he's, he, so that's a critique that Chomsky himself is making? I am uh, pretty sure, uh, I, I'll find that in a, in, a, in a conversation, I think this was uh, probably uh, 20 years old. I remember seeing it in a, you know, something was going terribly like he's wrong. He's on stage uh, some, and someone was asking him this question. Is that the clip? Yes. That's the clip. I wow. think, yeah, I remember, I, I need to find it, but he, he did make the argument that, you know, that's not real socialism. Now I am butchering what he said, but the essence of it was that. Well, it seems like one of the, the antidotes to extremism that, that you both kind of like highlighted is if the people in the tribe took out the trash of its own tribe, so like if let's say, you know, like you're, you identify as a leftist or you identify as somebody who's more conservative. If you criticize your extremes, your, the extreme factions of your, of, your, of, your, of your group, that that would be one possible antidote to, to attenuating the tribalism that could lead to, you know, more extreme kind of like civil war kind of situations. Is that, is that something you both agree with? I agree completely. And I, I, I do think, uh, again, I thank Kurt for pointing this out. Uh, we do need to take our own trash. We, we do need to question um, you know, uh, our own uh, because um, some of this that's happening in the West and it is because of our people. Again, with, with the, uh, what was happening with um, Islam and, and the West, you know, because we weren't honest enough to talk about what was happening, it just exacerbated the problem. And right now, again, it's repeating, we, we, we have to, we, we have no choice. If not, exactly as you put it, that our tribe, uh, you know, continue to uh, fight and with, a, with, an, with, a, with, an, with an enemy that it has sort of created out of more or less thin air. So Kurt, uh, you, you delved a lot into these concepts. Um, somebody actually wants to ask, who would you say are the two most relevant philosophers to read about to get a better understanding about where this current woke ideology comes from? Because if you want to tackle something, you got to understand where it comes from. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I do want to, I'm sorry, whoever that person is, I don't know. But 
I do want to talk about what you just mentioned, which is the tribes. I would say that it's, it's actually, I would disagree. I'd say that it's horrible to identify yourself with a tribe or you should do so so carefully because as soon as you do, then you think of yourself as part of a group and then you think us versus them and so on. It's, it's not take out the trash of your own tribe. You take out the trash of your own life and you constantly tell the truth and you constantly be loving and you have no idea how far that can reach and you have no idea how much your hatred for black people or white people comes from your mishandled relationship with your brother that you're jealous of or your mother. And if you were to, or if you were able to solve that or at least mitigate it, then, then you wouldn't go searching for virtue signaling and, 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 and harm that you think is, is positive. Okay, so it's better not to identify in yeah, uh, I would say, label. trash of yourself constantly, constantly, constantly. That's that's actually a really wonderful um, message. Actually, a lot of people um, in in the in the chat box, you have no idea. It's it's actually really nice to read this. Um, are really thankful. Somebody says that this should be should be shown in middle schools everywhere. And and actually, I I agree, and that's something that maybe you know fair can work with you both of you on especially as yeah, we, we thank get you. thank you thank you so much yeah and you, someone said that if they show this they'd be fired man what someone the said. heck i mean like i believe that that may be true or at least well, like I, a, wanna, a I, I, I want to point out but that's but remember that is what happened when a graduate student uh, in canada showed a jordan peterson film do you remember her like she yeah, actually Lindsay Shepherd, right right Lindsay she was going to be in the documentary actually oh really interesting yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I, and then she, she, then she moved to British Columbia. It's different issues, but okay. And so you you guys made this film during COVID. It seems like during the year that no. everything no it, was it actually was made. It was pretty much all the everything was done. When I say everything was done, what I mean filming wise, March twenty twenty, and then Desh came in and was and noticed that the film was almost unwatchable in many respects. Like unless you were heavily in heavily interested in the topic and already knew about the topic. So he's like, Kurt, we need to cut this. Also, Kurt, it's like you're just bashing the left. And I didn't mean that at all. I don't identify with the left or the right. I'm apolitical, or at least I consider myself to be apolitical. I think it's just such a complicated topic. I don't know how anyone can say I'm left or right. Like, there's so many different variables that, that it think, boggles I, my mind. I but think anyway, Maureen actually agrees with you. So Maureen says there is no question the extreme left is a great threat to liberalism and deeply racist akin to the extreme right. But, I, you know, there is obviously a difference in how they're both perceived in, in the mainstream press. Do you agree that there is no way out unless heads of universities and school boards, major media outlets and corporations refuse to allow it? It seems to me that unless this happens as a united effort, we can look forward to living in the second half of your film. Um, you know, what she's alluding to is that the, the sort of extremes of the left is permitted in these institutions, but not the extreme right. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, in some sense, I like I, I constantly try to take it, not try to, but I constantly see it being taken back to the, the small person. So it's like, you don't think, stop thinking until the media is right. No, make yourself right. And you'll it will blossom and you have no idea how powerful that is. Even for the next 20 years, it may, may be not short, it may be long-term, but there's a great definition of the good. The good is what survives. So by definition, and, the, and evil is what is temporary and transient. It, it, that takes a while to think about. I'm still, I'm still trying to make sense of that, but the good will survive. The good survives. So be good. The, uh, your memory, uh, what, what you think of as you may not survive, but if you identify with what's good, then you survive. And that's one way that you can go on past your death. And there's, I, I can't, I, it's a complicated, it's so, it's complicated. I can't wrap my head around it and I can't articulate it right now. Well, I, I think, you know, to some extent, a lot of parents in the last year have kind of woken up to, you know, the kind of indoctrination that their kids are, are facing in school. Partly it's, it's, we're lucky in a way, like it's a confluence of factors, the lockdowns, you know, schooling at home. And all of a sudden, you know, your kids used to go to school. They, they would kind of go kiss you goodbye in the morning. They went off. You didn't really see what they were being taught, but, but, you know, by some strange confluence of, of, of circumstances, all of a sudden they're zooming from home and parents, you know, in, in the summer, since George Floyd happened, uh, the, 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 
terrible killing of George Floyd, that people kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, there seems to be an overstep here. Um, my kids are actually being taught something radically different from what they thought they were being taught. And, and in a way became very attuned to some of these problems. And, and you know, I think that there has been um, an interesting kind of awakening to that. And so FAIR even was kind of founded in response to a lot of this discontent with what's happening um, at that level, but it's happening in other institutions, corporations as well. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, Kurt, perhaps one of the things that, you know, that, that can be done is just, sure, take care of yourself, make sure that you do good. But at the end of the day, if you don't organize, if you don't get into positions where you can influence others, we may not be able to turn the tide. Because if you think about it, you know, whatever woke ideology is, it has been actually um, growing in institutions for at least three to four decades before any of us woke up to it and said, wait a minute, what are our kids being taught? So there is a sense of, yes, organize, you know, get, get in touch with people, fellow parents at your school board, run for, for uh, positions of, of, of leadership in your kids' schools so that you can have a voice. Because at the end of the day, not everybody has a voice. And that's just, you know, the unfortunate structure of modern life. But, but you can work or position yourself in a way, in a way to do it. And, and in some ways, that's something that both of you have done with this film. You've, you've given us um, a, a product, a, a cultural product that, that, you know, asks certain questions, brings certain topics to the forefront. And, and I think that's, that's a very powerful thing. You, you, you did what your skills allowed you to do. And, um, you know, we're, we're very grateful you made that film. Man, we're grateful for you and, and your organization <laughs> and hosting this. Thank you, man. I mean, thank you, thank Melissa, you. not man. I, I know you're not gonna- <laughs> No, no, don't worry. This is thank a safe space. Total safe space, all of us in this group, you know, we're pretty hard to offend, like just by, by nature. I think that's why we're here. Um, we, we kind of see- I want the, to extend, uh, I, I want to extend the, uh, the, the thank you note that Kurt just gave really to all of FAIR. The fact that, um, you know, FAIR included our film um, and, and we just, uh, Kurt shared with me yesterday at one point, the film was number two on uh, um, iTunes documentary charts. Uh, we just, for a film like this, which, uh, you know, no, and, and I don't know if, if I ever told you, Kurt, but none of the distributors, the traditional distributors I worked with wanted to touch this film. They saw the trailer and they ran away. They did not want to touch this. So we did this entirely independently and the reach we are getting now is, is thanks to organizations like you and people who believe and people who saw what the film was about. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Jordan Peterson uh, and Steven Pinker and a whole bunch of people actually tweeted about it. So, you know, it, it, I, I appreciate every single one who supported it and your kind words here, you know, giving us a platform to talk about the film. I mean, it's, it's really to their detriment, right? Uh, in terms of the distributors not wanting to touch the film. I think uh, the same thing's happening in Hollywood. I know of people who have written scripts, comedians, you know, uh, script writers who were like, oh, I want to kind of make fun of this, you know, woke movement and kind of write stories about it. Nobody would touch it with the 10 foot pole because everybody assumes where the energy is in this movement. But in recent, I would say in recent months, just looking at the backlash, the backlash to, you know, Coca-Cola teaching people that be less white or, you know, Disney um, asking, you know, Gillette. white people or Gillette or schools dividing children into racial affinity groups, which is segregation. I have, I have no idea about that. It's. But there is a backlash. And I think if distributors, if Hollywood executives knew that, you know what, the numbers are probably not on your side, not with what's going on, as you can see the activism. If uh, all we need is that small minority, as you said, have the courage, come out, courage, speak out. Right. I think we can, I think we can shift this tide. I think this is a film that if kind of the, tr the, the, the truth was allowed to run its course would get a, ba a BAFTA nomination or something, you know? So that's, that's it. Four, is it 4 a.m. where you are? Uh, yes. Wow, yes. okay. Thank you okay. so much. Did you wait, did you stay up for this or did you yeah, wake of up? Course. Of course, no, I stayed up. Oh man. It's okay. Wait, you you're not, you're not sure, Dash, what time is it there? I don't even know. 
Dash is well, fine. it is. I'm fine. It's Friday midday for me, so I'm fine. This is perfect timing for me. Uh, <laughs> for me, I'm like this is extremely late. It's nine right now. It's almost, it's ten ten, and I'm and I have no idea how you're doing it, Melissa. Oh, it's just a lot of caffeine. I have four copies for this. When but, you, okay, <laughs> quickly, you mentioned Hollywood and the scripts. When I watch modern movies from, tw- I can tell what year the movie was made just based on how politically correct it is and then also i can tell which characters are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones just based on the race so as soon as i'm like okay that black guy so he's not going to be the kill he seems like he's the but it's going to be the white guy who's the straight one and (laughs) and, well why should i be able like invariably i'm with my wife i'm like yeah no no you think that but so and so she's great with movies from 2015 prior but then from 2015 onward i'm like i can predict every storyline and i shouldn't be able to just based on the race of the people there is an article to That's- be written about this, about how actually wokeness affects art and the quality of art. Um, you know, the fact that we can kind of look back and say like there was a artistic golden age, like a film, okay, a, a TV series. I don't know if any of you have seen something like Californication. It yep. is complex. Um, you know, the, the main character accidentally, well, without knowledge, sleeps with somebody who's like 60, like stuff like that can never be made today. Um, and so it, it is striking. And I, I consider that as, as, as you know, a, a, a series that is, is very complex and it's, it's a good par- it's a paragon of good art. Um, the, the novelist, the guy who wrote um, Up in the Air, starring George Clooney, Walter mm-hmm. Kiern is a huge supporter of what you guys are doing, what we're doing. And that was one of his things. He's like, you know, I, I wouldn't care about this if it wasn't for the fact that it's hindering our ability to create great art. Um, and I think that's actually very true. I, I, I hope the, the backlash continues. I hope uh, we're here for it. Um, I have recently had some conversations with some uh, uh, Hollywood uh, producers, um, there is a there's a there's a pressure cooker there, and some of them are getting to the end of. Uh, they know that they can't talk about certain things, but some of them are really getting to. Uh, they're in a pressure cooker. I do think, hopefully, if we all keep doing what we're doing, it will burst open. Uh, and I, I think, uh, uh, Melissa, to, to, to the point, what they need to realize is. It's a minority of voices that's propagating these terrible ideas, but they eventually get their way. That's history has shown us every single time. The majority of us who have these views should make sure we amplify our voices. So businesses, if they can really see where the money is, like it, our place where, where we are coming from, that's where the money is because we're the majority. Show it. And then they'll change that Hollywood at the end of the day, it's a business, right? You know, (laughs) so I I, I am hoping I'm very hopeful. I think the next few years, this pushback will continue and we will keep keep uh, our pressure and our farewell as well. And hopefully we can uh, change the tide. I think I'm very hopeful because I I know it happened with, you know, I I, I know it happened with the 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 um, Islam situation. I think there is a general understanding now uh, of, of that issue. Yeah, I agree. And, and so, you know, the antidote in some ways is really, you know, what, what Kurt said to just be really true to your opinion, because that's the way you make your number count in this fight. And you'd be so surprised at how if you speak up slightly, even just slightly, that someone else would say, oh, wow, I didn't know that you could speak up. And also, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be and, and, extremely surprised, and no one will say it. You're right, and actually, you're oh, I, I, that in the chat box, you know, like people saying, like, I am progressive, but I'm very skeptical about how these theories are being applied and how they're affecting our children. Um, and so, you know, like that connection first, knowing that you're not alone, is I think is very important. And you know, knowing that other people are asking the same questions and having the same misgivings. This is not just and this is the danger of 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 you know having a movement be be painted as something that's just coming from the right it is not all people of, of all persuasions you know have have been expressing misgivings but 
but it be and that's why anytime right, 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 right. See, anytime who makes the argument anytime who makes the argument oh that's a right wing talking point you know just remind people that you know that's no side has you know that's exactly first of all it's not an argument but also no one has an exclusivity on uh, what's right an or idea. wrong yeah. i agree yeah an idea exactly so uh, and that's where tolerance comes in because if you if you kind of respect somebody else as a moral agent there are limits to how you disagree with that person right if you don't dismiss that person outright if you were if you are a left wing person and you have a, a right wing friend but you really respect that person your best friend since like third grade you're going to at least you know respect that person enough to listen to not just dismiss outright and i think your film shows how extremism really is something that you get when people don't respect somebody else as moral agents and we just dismiss them offhand they are just evil they're not worthy of our engagement and that's that's how we start to unravel you know frankly the western project and, and civilization that, that's why i mentioned arrogance earlier because it's dismissing based on the lack of respect, but it's also that I think I know and I'm and you're definitely incorrect, so I don't need to investigate further or listen. I I think one of the best, someone was asking me like, what's a great practice I can do? Whenever you think of some argument, like let's say it's that, that white people are racist or the white people are not racist, then think what are the ways in which this is right and what are the ways in which this is wrong for every argument and write that down. So journal it and you'll see that you'll start to become so much more nuanced and you'll be you'll be much more tolerant of ideas you weren't tolerant of before right and i always like to play this game which is change the details change the parameters if what you say about all white people are racist now change this to a black black people asian whatever it is is it still racist is it something that you all get because if yes that's racist you know yeah, like they don't they just <laughs> redefine racism like that's how they get around that Right, right. I know. I know. You're right. But it, it behooves, you know, the kind of normal people also, looking. saying this. that's racist is not actually an argument that ends. It, <laughs> it shouldn't be. In a... I agree. I agree. I mean, we live in a world now that if you haven't been accused of that, you're probably doing some, you're not doing enough. You know, that's, that's kind of. <laughs> Man, Melissa, I don't know how you're able to keep your thoughts together. It's nine, it's 10 PM here. I'm barely able to keep it together. You're flowing. <laughs> like gender is a construct in my world. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, no, I. Time is a construct. Time is a social construct. <laughs> it's just a framing issue. Um, but anyway, thank you. Thank you both for your time. I, I don't want to keep you too long. We have already kind of overstayed. It's been I'm, more than a tour. I, so. I, it's a pleasure. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for everyone. I know it, I can see the chat box is going crazy and everyone who sent the questions. I know some people couldn't get all there. Uh, you know, we couldn't answer some of the questions. Thank you for everyone. And I saw if I may, somebody asked a question how they can contact us. Um, you know, we are both uh, on social media, Kurt and I, and uh, so the we'll website has details to contact us. Um, and, you know, just search our names and you, you, you'll be easily, we're easily accessible uh, and we want and to be Also, people. this clip is recorded for posterity. We'll load it up on YouTube. If you guys want to use the clip for your own, you know, your, your own promotions, go ahead. We'll, we'll yeah. share that. And other people who weren't able to join live, but really wanted to see it because, you know, they have lives, <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to watch it. And, well, you know, Chen, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, it's an honor for, for me thank and you. Thank you both for making this film and, you know, we'll do what we can to, get this into schools. I think that'll be very exciting. Uh, I think that's, 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 that's amazing if you can do too. that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both. And thank you everyone. All right. Take care, have a great weekend. Um, tomorrow we will be, uh, you know, I'll be hosting also a Q and A with Travis and Peter Bogosian. The, the film in question is called The Woke Reformation. Um, so if you haven't seen that already, it's it's actually shorter. It's not, it, it's, it's a, a short a, film. A shorter films, yeah. Um, it's called The Woke Reformation. So. Watch that and we'll reconvene 9 p.m. Eastern time. Again, 3 a.m. for me, but you know, what is time? So yeah. thank you. Good luck. You're gonna just sleep for days. Okay. <laughs> thank you both. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.